from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Kayode Okikionu. Tonight, over 600 Nigerians evacuated from Poland and Romania arrive in the country after fleeing the Russia-Ukraine conflict and returnees narrate their experiences in a bid to escape the war. The president says his administration is committed to protecting the interests of Nigerians across the world as he returns to Abuja after attending the 50th anniversary of a UN environmental program in Nairobi, Kenya. European Union election observation team Hill's enactment of the Electoral Act 2022 says the law will improve the country's electoral process. And UN Security Council holds emergency meeting following Russian attack on a nuclear plant in Ukraine, the largest in Europe. Plus more from our London studio in Around the World in Five. On business news tonight, tech giant Google suspends sale of all online advertising campaigns in Russia. And on sports news tonight, Leicester City forward Ademola Lukman gets his first national team call-up as he makes interim coach Augustin Ewelbon's provisional 32-man squad for Nigeria's World Cup qualifier against Ghana. Over 600 Nigerians have now returned to the country after fleeing the war in Ukraine following the invasion by Russian troops. The first to arrive were more than 450 returnees on board Max Air, which touched down at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in the nation's capital at exactly 7.10 a.m., most of them students from Romania. It was the first of the many flights expected to return Nigerians stranded in various countries in Europe who are escaping the crisis in Ukraine. The flight from Romania, conveying Nigerians stranded there while fleeing from the war in Ukraine, was built to touch down in Abuja at 3.30 a.m. As the hours go by, the media awaits any information on when the plane would arrive with the returnees. Finally, at about 7 a.m., the plane landed, carrying with it over 450 students and a few government officials. The welcome party, made up of several government agencies on board the aircraft, and they addressed the returnees. As we come down in two files, we will walk straight uh, to meet with Port Authority, and uh, there the Health Port Authority will give you forms to fill. We will only take your samples uh, for the COVID test. As you are all aware, it was waived for us before you got on the plane. Uh, the moment that is done, you will be directed to immigration. And as soon as you are done with immigration, we will direct you to where you will collect a token of transportation for you to be able to head back home. The majority leader of the House of Representatives, who was part of a delegation that went to Romania to bring back the returnees, says Nigeria's foreign missions need to be better prepared for crisis situations such as this one. Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs through the federal government next time uh, going forward should try to envisage some of these things as by way of emergency anticipation. So that when we are budgeting, we budget for the missions to be able to address these kind of circumstances whenever they come up. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs lays out its plans for the returnees, especially in terms of continuing the education. Our government is already talking with the, the governments of Poland, of Greece, of uh, Romania and Hungary to see if those of them that are in their fifth year medical student, I mean medical year, fifth and sixth year, can actually go back to universities in these countries to be able to complete their studies. 
While the students are being profiled and tested for COVID-19, they would be given $100 each to return to their various destinations across the country. There was indeed a sense of relief for this first batch of Nigerian evacuees who landed in their home country after enduring eight days of the ordeal that followed the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. While thanking the government for the effort deployed to bring them back to Nigeria safely, they called on the nation's foreign missions to be better equipped to handle these types of emergencies. Our correspondent Kela Megua spoke with some of them at the airport and brings us this report. The returnees from Romania have a story to tell, one which many young Nigerians may never experience in their lifetime. The experience of a full-blown war and what it means to have a refugee status outside of Nigeria. Where she wants to be, it's your DG that is new. Weary from their travels and traumatized by the idea that they could have been killed in the war between Russia and Ukraine, these over 400 young Nigerians, mostly students, tell us what it was like to escape the conflict. We were struggling, people were screaming, there was like a lot of tussle to get across the line. I even saw someone climb over people's heads just to get like into the border. It was like really very stressful crossing the Ukrainian side of the border. It was chaotic because everyone was fighting within themselves and nobody wanted to be the last to go. So it was very tight, so everyone was practically pushing. I, they, you know, there was a lot of stampede. I have joint pain, back pain. The sirens were like ringing every day and every day and every day, so that didn't make us feel safe, um, my own friends. So um, at a certain point we left, we went to the Syrian border, the border bordering Ukraine and Romania, and from there we were able to like cross, but it was terrible. An overwhelming sentiment among the returnees is the poor treatment they say they experienced from the Nigerian embassy in Kiev, Ukraine. We contacted them and we we're like, oh, that, oh, we need like help. Like, what are we doing? What are we going to do? And we we're like, students, um, take care of yourself, find a place that is safe. And that was strange to us because we we're expecting that, oh, maybe they will organize like a bus that will take all of us to like a border where we could cross from. But that was not the case. Maybe if the embassy in Kiev like gave like a special letter to all the borders maybe nigerians would have been able to pass easily more like easily but we weren't really getting like proper responses from them there's still so many questions about the impacts the war in ukraine has had on people but for these kids right behind me they're just glad to be back home right now they're going to be given a stipend by the federal government to ensure that they get to their respective destinations a lot of COVID tests are going on right now, and they are hoping that these processes are done quickly so they can go back to their families. Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. And about 11 hours after the MAX air flight conveying the first batch landed in Abuja, the second batch of the evacuees also arrived in the nation's capital from Poland aboard Air Peace. They are 183 citizens made up of 180 adults and three children who were received by government officials led by the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Sadia Omar Farouk. Over 5,000 Nigerians, majority of whom are students studying in Ukraine, have been caught up in the conflict. Well, also today, President Muhammad Buhari returned to Abuja after attending the 50th anniversary of United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, in Nairobi. While in Kenya, the president also met with a group of Nigerians resident in Nairobi, Kenya, where he gave the assurance that his administration will continue to defend interests of Nigerians wherever they may be. He maintained in a statement that the federal government has demonstrated its commitment to protecting the interests of all citizens in harm's way abroad, as was evident in Libya, South Africa, and now thousands of citizens, particularly students, who are caught up in the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. The president, who was represented at the event by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyama, commended the diasporans in Kenya for the unity and peace that has existed between them and their host communities. President Buhari had initially planned to proceed to London from Kenya, but sources at the presidency say that the president will embark on that trip on Sunday, March the 6th, for his routine medical check. In intellectual matters, more commendations on the heels of the president's assent to the electoral bill, this time from the European Union election observation team. 
The team believes that the Electoral Act 2022 has a range of measures that will improve the electoral process in the country. Addressing a news conference in Abuja, the head of the mission, Mrs. Maria Arena, explains that the act improves the timelines for elections and the use of technology for the electoral process. Our correspondent, Dili Omoyeni, reports. The European Union elections follow-up mission to Nigeria is completing its tour of the country after assessing the implementation of the 2019 EU recommendations and discussing further reform. The mission held the exercise at a time when the president signed into law the 2022 Electoral Act, an instrument that is expected to transform the nation's electoral process. The passing of the new Electoral Act is a very positive step forward. The new Act comprehensively introduces a range of measures that improve the election process. It is impressive how the National Assembly, INEC and civil society worked together on this. It is a big achievement that paves the way for improvement in future electoral processes. In its final report, the mission wants the Independent National Electoral Commission to improve on the use of technology, especially the Bimodal Voter Accreditation System, BIVAS. Another serious challenge is the introduction of new technology for the accreditation of voters in polling units. We urge INEC to do a comprehensive lessons learned exercise in the use of BIVAS and to have an independent evaluation of their use and to develop a full plan accordingly. This need to include provision for integrity checks, risk mitigation, contingency planning, as well as provision for independent scrutiny and public information. The European Union delegation in Nigeria has undertaken long-term support to strengthening democracy and electoral processes in Nigeria. The regional body is not relenting in funding efforts to ensure a credible electoral process in Nigeria. The new program, uh, which amounts to 39 million uh, euros, uh, has uh, the overall objective to foster a functioning, pluralistic, inclusive, participatory and representative democracy in, uh, in Nigeria with uh, uh, six main areas. The mission also raises concerns that the increase in spending limits for candidates creates incentives for corruption. From Abuja, Dili Amoyeni, Channels Television News. And to security, Nigeria has moved to sixth position in the latest Global Terrorism Index following successes in the fight against Boko Haram insurgents. The country dropped two places from fourth, a position it had occupied since 2017 in the ranking published by an independent and non-profit think tank, the Institute for Economics and Peace. The GTI showed that Nigeria, Syria and Somalia are the only nations among the ten most affected by terrorism to get an improved rating from 2020 to 2021. According to the report, total deaths from terrorism in Nigeria fell to 448 in 2021, the lowest level since 2011. It attributed this decline to the death of Boko Haram leader Abubakar Shekau and the federal government's efforts at defeat in the group. But in spite of this gain, the GTI claims that the number of terrorist attacks increased by 49 percent between 2020 and 2021, with 36 percent of attacks claimed by ISWAP while Boko Haram is responsible for 8% and 44% not attributed to any group. And over to the court, a federal high court sitting in Lagos has fixed May the 24th for the arraignment of Senator Ifai Uba and his firm, Capital Oil and Gas Industries, in connection with the disputed 135 billion Naira debt. Justice Nicholas Awebo fixed a date following a consensus between the prosecutor, the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, AMCON, and the defendant's counsel, although Senator Oba, representing a number of South Senatorial District, was absent in court. Justice Awebo also granted an application directing AMCON to either paste the eight-count charge it filed against the lawmaker and his firm at his residence or serve him via the clerk of the National Assembly. The court made the order after the prosecutor submitted that it had, uh, it had 
it had been difficult to personally serve him a copy of a charge, making it necessary to use substituted means. In the amended charge, which now replaces Amcon's initial four-count charge against the lawmaker, Amcon alleges that UBA and his firm, or rather UBA and his firm, between 2012 and 2018 conspired to make false claims in relation to the actual values of certain assets transferred to Amcon under a consent judgment he and his firm made with Amcon. Senator Obama and his firm were also alleged to have obstructed Amcon from implementing the Amcon Act in realization of parts of his alleged outstanding debt of 135 billion naira by frustrating the sale of property at Banana Island, Lagos. Coming up on the news at 10, we have more from the courts as Nollywood actor Babai Jesha testifies. Plus, some communities in Sapele and Okwe local government areas of Delta State lament impact of oil spill from wellheads on their livelihood. That's after the break. Join us again. back if you've just joined us you're watching the news at 10 live on channels television lagos a reminder of our top stories over 600 nigerians evacuated from poland and romania arrive in the country after fleeing the russian ukraine conflict returnees narrate their experiences in a bid to escape the war the president says his administration is committed to protecting the interests of Nigerians across the world as he returns to Abuja after attending the 50th anniversary of the UN Environmental Program in Nairobi, Kenya. The European Union Election Observation Team hails the enactment of the Electoral Act 2022, says the law will improve the country's electoral process. And UN Security Council holds emergency meeting following Russian attack on a nuclear plant in Ukraine the largest in Europe. Well, staying with the judiciary, the trial of Nollywood actor Olari Wajir James, popularly known as Babai Jesha, resumed today at the Lagos State Special Offences Court in Ikeja, with the defendant telling the court that Damilola Adekoya, the guardian of his alleged victim, was his former lover. Babai Jesha, who was testifying in his own defense, also told Justice Oluwatoi Taiwo that Adekoya, popularly known as Princess, is after him because he ended his relationship with her. Babai Jesha is facing a six-count charge bordering on allegations of indecent treatment of a child and sexual assault, which he had pleaded not guilty to. Babai Jesha also said that the evidence he gave in court in his defense was not an afterthought, insisting that much ev evidence existed to show that he and Princess were in a relationship, though such evidence was not tendered in court. Justice Taiwo has adjourned the matter to March the 11th for the continuation of defense. And away from the courts, it was an impressive roll call of distinguished women at the International Women's Day celebration sponsored by the Bank of Industry in Lagos. Well, the event, which was chaired by the Minister of State for Industry, Trade and Investment, Ambassador Mariam Katagum, also had some participants join physically, while others joined virtually. The other news... Attending physically in this large hall are at least 350 persons, most of them women. It's a convivial atmosphere, studded with ministers, governor's wives and other important personalities at the BOI International Women's Day celebration. More than 100 participate online. In focus is the problem of gender inequity, which the managing director and chief executive officer of the Bank of Industry outlines. When they get a STEM education, women also face biases at the recruitment stage. BUI plays an important role in advocating for women-owned businesses by focusing on impact as we recognize that economic opportunities these businesses present and their contribution to national development. 
The women are dissatisfied with what they see as discrimination against the perceived weaker sex, but determined to stand against it. It is crucial to speak up against bias when identified. It means advocating for and recognizing the excellent work done by women in the workplace. I'm happy to announce that despite the setback of Tuesday at the National Assembly, I presented the new National Gender Policy 2021 to 2026, and it was unanimously accepted and approved by the Federal Executive Council. Beyond saying it, we must prove it that we are equal to holding aid. Let's jettison being included by somebody. We are majority. In a panel discussion, organizers take issues up a notch by rubbing minds on what to do in male-dominated spaces to get ahead in life. As, as a woman, you have to try harder than everyone else. You also have to not seem aggressive. We have to stop making it a gender problem or oh, oh, help us women or oh, champion us. We don't need champions. This is a problem for you equally. After the disappointment of every gender bill being thrown out at the National Assembly, these women are being advised to be bold, prove their worth in their areas of endeavor, and actively push the other woman up when she aspires to achieve her dreams, to break the bias against her gender. And elsewhere, the inauguration of projects in River State continued today with Governor Yesom Wike commissioning a 10.2 kilometer road in Ahoda East local government area, a day after inaugurating the Ahoda Equina Road in the same area. But during the commissioning, Governor Wike restated the commitment of the People's Democratic Party to provide effective leadership in Nigeria, including the emancipation of women in all spheres of endeavors. River State Governor Inyesa Mwike, former Kaduna State Governor Ahmed Makafi, and chieftains of the People's Democratic Party arrive at Ahoda, East Local Government Area, to commission the Ahoda Odemiri Ihubobo Odieke Road. Your Excellencies, may I, with your permission, adopt protocols previously established. The River State Commissioner for Works, Mr. Eloka Tasiamadi, outlines the socioeconomic benefits to the people of the area. Capacities of small contractors involved in the project construction are strengthened. The livelihood of the livelihood conditions of the rural people residing in the area of influence of the road improves. Governor Wike uses the opportunity to advocate for special privileges for women in political leadership and government. Look at in this state as a matter of policy. We said every vice chairman of this local government must be a woman. I don't need any law to be made. It's a matter of leadership. It's a matter of policy of the party. We are going to do this, we are going to do that. And we agreed. If you say the women will not be chairman, the women cannot also be refused the position of vice chairman. Today in this state, all the 23 vice chairmen are women. Senator McAfee, who was the special guest, seeks unity, harmony, and cohesion from members of the People's Democratic Party ahead of the 2023 elections. We, the People's Democratic Party, must be united, must know that we need a strong party, we need unity, we need to take out personal interest and sit down and look at the surest way of returning to power come 2023. The Ahoda Odemiri Ihubo Deke Road, which is 10.2 kilometers, is expected to enhance the businesses of the people. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and now, the governor of Nassau State, Abdullahi Suley, has thrown his weight behind local government autonomy bill in the National Assembly amendment process, but expressed disappointment over the gender bills uh, which didn't sail through at the National Assembly. He said he had hoped that the vote 
gone differently, as he believes this would have helped him give an equal right to both genders. On local government autonomy, he speaks highly of his record, saying his administration had implemented autonomy since he became governor in 2019. He'll speak in, on Channels TV's hard copy. We came in uh, May 2019, and then June 2019, that's where the autonomy actually began. And for us in Israel State, we implemented immediately. So from June 2019, we have been implementing the local government economy. Autonomy. We, aut autonomy, sorry. I don't touch any part of their money. Once it comes, it goes directly to them. They come from time to time to show me the template on how they are spending the money. But as far as participating in how they spend it, also I don't participate. You know, so in, the st in, in, in our state, we have been practicing that. I'm a Muslim. And I know limitations when it comes to issue about, you know, uh, men and women and things like that in the, in, the, in the religion. You know, so, but to be honest with you, the way the vote went, I was hoping it didn't go like that. You know, I was hoping it would have gone where, you know, you involve people, you, 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 you make sure you give people the, the right, you know, to do certain things. So I, I strongly believe you know, that we should give people equal opportunity. I'm not talking to you because you are a woman. I'm talking, I'm, I'm saying it from us in the state, what we have done so far. The chief judge of the state, in our state, for the first time is a woman, you know, and she is doing a fantastic job. I have worked with men, women a lot. And by the way, you know, to, to be personal now, I'm extremely close to my mother. My mother is my biggest advisor, you know, so she's still alive. I'm going, where I go and sit to her, and she, she guides me, she, she tells me this, she, you know, so I'm extremely close to her. You know, so for that reason, you know, I don't see uh, some of these things the way others see, with all due respect. Well, the next time you see Nigerian female police officers wearing star earrings and a headscarf under their barrettes or pea caps, do not be surprised. And this is because the Inspector General of Police, Usman Al Kalibaba, has approved a new dress code for women officers, which permits them to appear in the outfit while in uniform. A statement from the acting police spokesperson, CSP Ulumuiwa Dejabi, explains that. The dress code was unveiled at the IGP's meeting with strategic police managers, where he noted that the Nigeria police workforce has officers from every local government in the country, with a variety of ethnic and religious backgrounds and an increased inclusion of female folks. In the words of the police chief, this therefore brings the need to guarantee inclusion, gender mainstreaming, ethnic and religious diversity in the workplace for optimum output and professionalism. However, the dress code is optional and senior women police officers have been asked to ensure compliance with the approved standard for women police officers who have opted to adopt it. Also ahead, tech giant Google suspends the sale of all online advertising campaigns in Russia. Well, that's some business news. Join us again. The people of Amokokwa Elume community and eight other neighboring communities in Sapele and Okwe local government areas of Delta State are currently grappling with oil spill from wellheads said to be operated by con oil. According to the people, the spill which occurred last week has destroyed aquatic life, crippling fishing activities, as well as exposing them to waterborne and skin diseases. They're calling on the management of con oil and government at all levels to come to their aid. For close to five days now, the waterways of about nine communities in Sapele and Okwe have become contaminated, arising from this oil gushing out of its well. The well belonging to oil giant Con Oil has continued to spill into the waterways, crippling economic activities of residents here, whose major occupation is fishing and farming. <laughs> Lamenting the health risks emanating from the spill, the people are calling on government at all levels as well as the oil company to quickly come to their rescue. I'm on the top of oil again. I stand for here. 
So and fishing now is our occupation. We have nothing doing than fishing. But now the river now, all people, if you if you see here now, all the all the things we are using for fishing now, all damaged. The, the river is full of them now. We have nowhere, nothing to eat now. We just stay here now for nothing. Just a whole community are suffering for what they eat. And the river is being given up by Jehovah, not we. So we are now in quite more percent hunger. This way here is Amokpo River, and the Amokpo are the people that are passing through the pains of everything that comes out of the way held. I am using this medium to appeal to the state governor to please prevail on Conoyer as this river is the only source of our life holds here and other farming activities. We contacted the community relations manager of corn oil, Mr. Richard Edagbai, but he declined making comments on the issue. The negative impact of this spill cannot be overemphasized, as communities around here depend on the river as their major source of water for drinking, cooking, transportation, and other activities. The governor of Edo State, Mr. Godwin Obasaki, has expressed willingness to work with the federal government in revamping the fortunes of the Okomo National Park and in upgrading security around other forest reserves in the state. Governor Obasaki made the pledge when he visited the Okomo National Park, located in Ovia Southwest local government area of Edo State. <laughs> The Okomo National Park Rangers form a guard of honor for their guest, the Edo State Governor, Mr. Godwin Obasaki. Guard, ready for inspection, sir! Governor Obasaki inspects the parade before heading for the office of the conservator of the National Park. His visit is to get first-hand information on reports of criminal activities around the park and the forest reserves. Our government cannot and will not just sit back and allow the kind of brigandage, of brigandry and you know, criminality that we are seeing in this axis. Our worry is that if we don't, come, if we don't confront them now, it will get out of hand and we are hoping that we'll get much fuller report from you uh, to understand clearly um, how the criminals are operating. Mr. Obaseki so, pledges support so. to promote the services of the national asset, including security. So we'll see how we can increase the force, the number of rangers and the number of park service officers who are available to protect not only this park, what some of the other reserves around here, particularly the Okomo Reserve and the Gele Gele Reserve. The conservator of the Okomo National Park, Augustin Obekba, decries illegal logging and hunting as some of the illegal activities taking place in the area. He notes that the existence of some very rare animals within the facility is under threat. There are some very significant species of animals, like the buffalo, elephant, white rooted monkey, which is endemic to this state. But our major challenge is the logging, which actually is destroying the habitat of the animals. Before leaving, Governor Obaseki also revealed to the Okomo National Park Management his plans of forwarding a forestry bill to the legislature for consideration a bill that will bust the strides taken in protecting forest reserves across the state. Also making moves to open up his state's economy is Governor Dakwa Biodo of Ongu State, who has hinted that the state-owned agro-cargo airport located at the Peru area of the state will be ready by November this year and will be commissioned by December. This cherry news was given by the governor in Jabodi while giving the progress report on the project during the Ogu East senatorial meeting held at the Jabodi local government area secretariat in Jabodi. He said that the multi billion naira project will turn the socio-economic fortunes of the state for, uh, for good as about 25,000 employment opportunities will be created in the project value chain and ecosystem.
commissioned that airport, meaning that planes will begin to land in Oguist. Aircraft will begin to take off from here. Aircraft Between now and November, there will be hotels that will be constructed there. There will be warehouses that will be constructed there. Nigerian customs is coming there. Nigerian Air Force is coming there. The employment opportunities that will be generated from that infrastructure development. We are establishing the special agro-processing zone today where all the agro-produce around here will be taken for processing into finished goods. We estimate that in the first 18 months we will create a minimum of 25,000 jobs in that airport. 25,000. Well, let's now bring you more business stories on the news at 10. Here's Teniola Shibawali. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Kayade. Welcome to Business News. Tech giant Google says it has suspended the sale of all online advertising in Russia. The suspension applies to ads on search, YouTube and display marketing. The move comes after Russian internet regulator demanded that the company stop showing ads described as a forced display of the Ukraine war. Earlier this week, Google had stopped advertising content produced by Russian state media, joining the list of corporate organizations shunning the country. British gas prices soared today, with some contracts hitting all-time highs as market participants continue to fare disruptions to Russian gas supplies to Europe. British wholesale gas for April delivery jumped 30 percent to a record 455 pence per therm as Russian invasion forces seized the Ukraine nuclear power plant. According to analysts, if gas prices stay at the current high levels, UK energy household bills, which are rising by 54% in April are likely to rise further at the next review in October. U.S. employers have hired far more workers than expected in February, pushing the labor market closer to maximum employment. The latest report from the U.S. Labor Department shows that non-farm payrolls surged by 678,000 jobs last month. Also, unemployment rates dropped by 3.8 percent, the lowest since February 2020, from 4 percent in January. However, the report further notes that rising headwinds from geopolitical tensions could hurt business confidence and slow job growth in the months ahead. Japanese electronic giant Sony is set to partner with car maker Honda to develop electric vehicles. In a statement issued today, the two firms say that they have signed a memorandum of understanding and will proceed with negotiations with the new venture being formed sometime this year, subject to the regulatory approvals. The alliance aims to bring together Honda's mobility development capabilities and Sony's expertise in the development and application of imaging, sensing and entertainment technologies. The sales of the first EV model from the new company are expected to start in 2025. And back home, the Nigerian Customs Service says it's targeting a revenue 
of 3.02 trillion naira for this year. The Comptroller General of the NCS, Colonel Mohamed Ali, made this known while defending the 2022 budget of the agency before the Senate Committee on Customs, Excise and Tariff. According to him, the new target is 965.40 billion naira, higher than the agency's target for 2021, and 1.55 trillion naira higher than that the, the 1.47 trillion naira target set by the National Assembly for Revenue Generating Agencies for 2022. He mentioned that the customs is expecting 2.02 trillion naira from the Federation, 253.23 billion naira from non-Federation and 746.96 billion naira from import value added tax. However, the customs boss cautioned that the target revenue for the agency for the year is high and at risk of hurting the economy if increased any further. Meanwhile, the Federal Inland Revenue Service has announced the opening of a one-month window from March the 1st to enable taxpayers settle foreign currency tax liabilities in Naira. This was made known today in a statement by the chairman of the FRS, Mr. Mohamed Nami. According to him, the concession is available to all taxpayers and tax types except for companies in the upstream oil and gas sector. And the equities market closed the last trading day of the week in negative territory. The all share index dipped further by 0.08% amid profit taken by investors. Laddie Williams has the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, the equities market ends the week in the red, with sell pressure dominating most parts of the trading sessions, the month-to-date loss stands at around 0.2%. <laughs> Standard drop in the market, uh, which comes amidst mixed sentiment on the sectoral chart, came largely on the back of profit-taking on blue-chip stocks such as Zenith Bank, GTCO, UBA, and MTN Nigeria. However, market breadth in terms of price movement was positive, with 20 gainers led by small-cap industrial uh, conglomerate John Holt, while Royal Exchange led 16 other losers down 9.4%. The activity charts, uh, mostly in the red, see volume is down about 26% uh, from yesterday's session. Also in red is value of stocks traded down about 69% in 4,654 deals. The trio of FCMB, Zenith Bank, FBNH were the most traded by volume, adding over 500 million units to the uh, total uh, stocks traded today. Well, the bulls couldn't dominate this week, but traders expect investors will take advantage of some high-value equities. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ladi Williams. It's back to you. Thanks a lot, Ladi. Now let's check out the closing numbers for other major markets around the world. And that's business news tonight. I'm Tenyo Lashobo Ale. It's back to Kayade for the rest of the news at 10. Banking so easy, so simple. Dow Star 894 Hatch. Now to experience it. You first. First bank. Well, thank you, Tenny. Back to our coverage of the Russia-Ukraine war, the UN Security Council has met in New York for an emergency meeting following Russia's shelling of a nuclear power station in Ukraine that is now under its control. The U.S. says Russia's actions were reckless and dangerous, but Moscow denies being behind the attack. We'll hear Simon Pusey with more on this and other international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. In the dead of night, Russian forces shelling Europe's largest nuclear power plant. 
And this is the result. A fire at the Zaporizhia power station causing international outrage. The fire has since been put out and officials say the site is safe. But in a message, Ukrainian President Zelensky said the attack could have caused an explosion six times the size of Chernobyl. And experts are still concerned about the safety of the site. Leaders around the world have also condemned the attack. We condemn the attacks on civilians uh, and over the night we have also seen reports about the attack against the nuclear power plant. Uh, this just demonstrates the rec recklessness of this war and the importance of uh, ending it and uh, the importance of Russia withdrawing all its troops and engaging good faith in diplomatic uh, efforts. Russia's attack last night put Europe's largest nuclear power at grave risk. It was incredibly reckless and dangerous, and it threatened the safety of civilians across Russia, Ukraine, and Europe. Colleagues, this is the first time that a state has attacked a fueled and functioning nuclear power plant. International law requires special protection for nuclear facilities. And it is difficult to see how Russia's actions were compatible with its commitments under Article 56 of the Additional Protocol of the Geneva's Conventions. It must not happen again. Meanwhile, the strategic port city of Maripol has been under constant attack. Mobile phone footage showing apartment buildings on fire. Russian forces also increased attacks on Chernihiv. Ukrainian emergency services saying at least 47 people have died in the town. And people have been sharing before and after photos online. These are not military landmarks or strategic facilities, just apartment blocks where people once lived. Russia's foreign minister too today accusing Russian soldiers of rape. When bombs fall on your cities, when uh, soldiers rape uh, women in the occupied cities, and we have numerous cases, of, unfortunately, when Russian soldiers rape uh, women in, in the Ukrainian cities, it's difficult, of course, to speak about the efficiency of the international law. Meanwhile, overnight, the U.S. slapped sanctions on a further eight oligarchs, many of them close to Vladimir Putin. In other news, at least 30 people have been killed at a bombing at a mosque during Friday prayers in Pakistan. The death toll is expected to rise as many of those injured are in a critical condition. South Korea's government has issued a natural disaster alert after a wildfire broke out near a nuclear power plant. The Hanul plant, which has six reactors, is situated close to the fires which have so far destroyed 12 residential properties. And a Venezuelan migrant who fled his country has been living in a tree house near the border between Venezuela and Colombia for more than four years. Carlos Sanchez left for Colombia in 2016 but ended up building his current residence after making friends with the local landowner. His house is decorated with pictures of his daughters and grandchildren, to whom he sends money to weekly. And that's for international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thank you, Simon, and welcome to Sports News. Interim Super Eagles coach Augustine Aguavon has named Leicester City forward Ademola Lukman in a provisional list of 32 Nigeria's World Cup qualifier against Ghana players. FC Copenhagen and former under-17 winger Akinkumi Amo has also been listed, 
with Victor Osimen, Odion Igalo, Ogene Karo Etebo, Frank Onyeka and Emmanuel Dennis returning after missing the AFCON in Cameroon. In total, Augustine Nagwavon named 25 players on the main list with seven including Ogeni Onazi on standby. Camp opens in Abuja on March the 21st before the squad is pruned to 24 for the two-legged clash on March the 25th and 29th. The chairman of the Delta 2022 National Sports Festival Local Organizing Committee, Patrick Uka, has confirmed that the mascot for the Games will be unveiled on April the 7th. Uka was speaking during the LOC's first official press briefing in Asaba, the Delta state capital. He believes the state is ready to host the best games ever that will not only surpass previous festivals but also set a standard for future competitions. The 2022 National Sports Festival will hold from November the 2nd to the 15th. I will also be very happy to announce to you that on the 7th of April, we'll be unveiling the logo and the mascot to the world. You are aware that as part of the preconditions, for bidding to win the hosting of these games was that these things will be ready. And these things have been ready since two years ago. We'll be very happy to deliver one of the best games that Nigeria has ever held. Ukrainian athletes were given a warm welcome as the Winter Paralympics opened earlier today. International Paralympic Committee President Andrew Parsons made an impassioned call for peace during the ceremony at the Bird's Nest Stadium that was attended by Chinese President Xi Jinping. At the IPC, we aspire to a better and more inclusive world, free from discrimination, free from hate, free from ignorance, and free from conflict. Know that an opponent does not have to be an enemy, and that united, we can achieve more much more. Tonight, the Paralympic movement calls on world authorities to come together as athletes do, promote peace, understanding and inclusion. Meanwhile, an expert in sports law, Antoine Duval, believes Russian Football Federation may not be successful in their appeal to CAS following the ban by FIFA and UEFA of their national teams. He says allowing Russian to compete could seriously undermine the governing body's tournaments because other teams could threaten to pull out. And that's a wrap on Sports News. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Victor Mathias. Have a splendid weekend. It's back to Kaidi with the wrap of the news at 10. Thanks a lot, Victor. And the main news again. Over 600 Nigerians evacuated from Poland and Romania arrived the country today after fleeing the Russia-Ukraine conflict and some of the retainers narrate their experience in their bid to escape the war. Also today, President Mohamed Buhari said his administration is committed to protecting the interest of Nigerians across the world. He stated this on his return to Abuja from Kenya after attending the 50th anniversary of the UN Environmental Programme in that country. And UN Security Council today held an emergency meeting after Russia launched an attack on a nuclear plant in Ukraine. And that's the news at 10 for tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kaya Okikili. It's good night.